Yeah. He's going to take off into the wind. So if you look to your right, you can see the wind suck. That means oh, yeah. he's going to go down to the end of the runway. We have 5,000 feet of turf runway here. He's going to go down the other end, turn around, and conduct a run-up. During the run-up, the pilot's listening to the engines, feeling for unusual vibrations or listening for any unusual sounds that indicate that the engines themselves might not be ready for flight or that there's any other issue with the airplane. You already saw that he conducted his control check here on the ramp with spotters outside the airplane communicating to him with hand signals that his controls were free and correct. And when he gets down the other end, we will let you stop and listen for the run-up because it's an interesting range of sounds as the propeller pitches are adjusted and so on. In the meantime, however, we're gonna talk a little bit more about one of the JU-52's more unusual characteristics. Did anyone notice that it kind of looks like a flying shed? It has corrugated, corrugated sides, corrugated wings. That's because this airplane was designed and built well in advance of World War II when duraluminum, the material it's constructed from, was brand new. Hugo Junkers understood that by forming this particular lightweight aluminum alloy into corrugations, he could give the airplane an incredible amount of additional strength giving it the ability to operate in conditions that simply weren't appropriate for the contemporary aircraft that featured wood and fabric construction. Then, then I can go on. What year time frame was this designed and then built to So the JU-52 is an interesting design story because it actually begins just a few months after Germany's defeat in World War I when Hugo Junkers introduced the F-13, the first all-metal modern airliner. Now, it still had an open cockpit. The pilots kind of sat kind of awkwardly half in the airplane and half outside of it. The ultimate continued work on the duraluminum material, the corrugations, and the sturdiness of his airframe designs led to what was a single-engine version of the Ju-52 that saw service extensively in Canada. However, the three engines were ultimately decided on and added to the final production variant of the Ju-52 based on a need for reliability. In the 30s, engine reliability simply wasn't what it needed to be. So an airplane featuring only one single engine had a reasonable chance of experiencing a failure during its flight, making it very unpopular with civilian airline passengers. So the Ju-52, with its introduction of these three BMW power plants, again, ours features the American version of the engine, actually had a lot to do with making passengers comfortable with civilian air travel. The Ju-52 did a lot for the perception that air travel was a speedy and reliable way to visit your next vacation destination or business trip, as opposed to a high-risk endeavor only to be undertaken by daredevils. Now, folks, if you listen down there, you can hear him doing the run-up. So the Ju-52 was, again, incredibly important to the establishment of air travel routes on the continent. It had the ability to carry 500 gallons of aviation fuel, which gave the airplane a 540-mile range. 
It didn't, however, go particularly fast. Fast as compared to a train, fast as compared to early motor cars. But uh, fully loaded, maximum speed is about 150 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, as Mitch says, 150 miles an hour downhill. Uh, that does mean we're going to get a pretty cool performance from the airplane here today because you will see that it will become airborne just north of 60 miles an hour. Oh, so that was an intentional characteristic. Hugo Junker specifically designed it to have great takeoff and landing characteristics and slow speeds required so that it could operate more effectively <laughs> off of unimproved airfield facilities. At the time, to build an airport, you didn't necessarily need a runway. You needed a grass field. A big open square grass field and the airplanes would always land into the wind across that open field. That did mean that one of the JU-52's impressive accomplishments as a civilian airliner though was shortening the travel time to Rome to a short 10 hours from Berlin. It was the first civilian airliner to tackle the crossing of the Alps and to do so safely. It also meant that cities considered well outside the range of air travel, like Stockholm, about 540 miles away, were now comfortably within reach of the business traveler. The impressive capabilities of the airplane meant that Lufthansa very quickly beca became the biggest air carrier on con in continental Europe, with routes extending all across the continent. And a partnership that it had was with another German airline that was formed with China named Eurasia, and they actually connected JU-52s from Lufthansa to JU-52s flying out of China, and that meant for the first time you could cross all of continental Asia by air. Still doing so it might be fair to ask why one of history's most influential airliners is here painted up as a Nazi war machine from the Second World War and why it's represented in the collection of the Military Aviation Museum. Well, that's because this airplane became one of the mainstay aircraft of the Luftwaffe, filling a number of roles for them. It's obviously well suited to the role of transport. Being able to carry 17 passengers meant that you could carry 17 fully equipped soldiers as well. But interestingly, the Luftwaffe's first uh, combat use of JU-52s was as what they called an auxiliary bomber. They actually used the airplanes in the Spanish Civil War as part of what was called the Condor Legion, which was a nationalist German force sent to support Franco, the dictator who was trying to achieve power in Spain. The airplane had two vertical bomb bays installed in it with the ability to carry 3,300 pounds of bombs. It's used by both Lufthansa and the German military meant that on one of its first outings bombing the suburbs of the city of Madrid, Lufthansa was servicing Madrid's downtown airport with civilian JU-52s at the very same time, which they then had to stop doing for the risk that the civilian airplanes would be shot down for fear that they might be Luftwaffe bombers. And when the Second World War began in earnest, Blitzkrieg, the German attack against the Low Countries, required the ability to keep your armies moving exceptionally fast. Of course, the Panzers, the German mechanized infantry, had become famous for their sweep across France, Holland, and Belgium. But the JU-52 played a critical role in that advance, being able to move men and supplies forward faster than many of the conventional means available at the time. All right, folks, we're going to pause the narration now because he's taking to the runway for his takeoff roll. You're going to want to get those cameras ready, and again, he'll be taking off from right to left.
tip off, you might have noticed that there was a window partway rolled down, about halfway down the fuselage. The airplane does feature roll-down windows. Sure. Other creature comforts available to pilots and crew in the uh, 80 mile per hour Junkers Ju-52 included a typewriter, an essential requirement for the business traveler at that time, as well as a smoking chamber for anyone who wanted to smoke on board the aircraft, and restroom facilities, of course. Many of these features were totally new to air travel at the time they were introduced on the JU-52. right back here and give us a great opportunity to get a picture of the airplane against that clear blue sky section. 